We have a little bit different situation out there in the men's meeting. <laughs> we have a wonderful time, though, don't we, men? We, we, we seek the Lord, and, and we've been praying for rain, and, and God sent some rain. <laughs> I need to get a bigger bucket. Never underestimate God. Amen. So I want to start with some scripture today, and then Scott will roll that up, and then we'll need it back towards the end there. I always like to start with scripture because every church service should be based, and every sermon should be based on the Word of God. Not on my philosophy, not on my thought patterns, not what I read about what men think about God, but I want to read what God says about God. I don't want to read what men say about God as much as I want to read what God says about God. So here in Lamentations, the prophet Jeremiah, he's lamenting over Israel. And many people relegate this to the Psalms, but it's not in Psalms. It's in Lamentations. And it is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Oh, I love this scripture. I love this scripture. Because his compassions, they fail not. They are new every morning, for great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul, therefore will I hope in him. So one of the things that you can do is you can have hope because of the mercies of the Lord God Almighty and that his compassions, they never fail. God is merciful and I praise God that he is. And, and he talks about that in the laments for Israel that it, it, it's just God's mercy that we're not consumed. And so I want to look at another scripture in Hebrews 11.4. By faith, and this is in Hebrews well before or Apostle Paul, he's talking about all the champions of faith in the Old Testament. And Abel is one of the first one that comes up, and he says, And Abel, by faith, offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. So there are more excellent sacrifices than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, and God testifying of his gifts, and yet by he being dead, yet speaketh. How can dead men speak? How can dead men speak? So, in Genesis 2.17, I'm just going to turn there and read that. It's, it's not going to be up here. But one of the things I deal with as a pastor is, is God mean? <laughs> and, and, and this is what I want to read. And God was talking to Adam. And he said, "Listen, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest, therefore thou shalt surely die. Not maybe, not possibly, thou shalt surely die. So a lot of, a lot of people as a pastor, well, pastor, I don't understand why God would be like that. So I'm going to ask you a question. In a time of war, what is the penalty for treason and rebellion against a country in a time of war? You said it right. It's death. It's death. I looked it up. Virtually every country in the world still has in a time of war. The penalty for treason is death. Wow. Why do we give man... <laughs> it's fixing to rain. Uh, in times of war... Everybody's phone is again. <laughs> Navajo County. Yeah, okay. Why don't we allow the God the same privilege that nations have on the earth to protect themselves? We sing a song, God is holy. God is, God is holy. He's holy. He's mighty. He's powerful. And yet when Adam and Eve sinned, they committed treason against heaven. They committed rebellion, which is treason before God. And God said, the penalty is death. So we have one standard for God in relation to the way that he works. And we have another standard for man on the earth. No, 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 no. Come on. Don't put God in this situation of saying, man, he's mean and he's angry. Where I believe if we're at war in America and somebody, somebody subverts us and creates rebellion and treason, I, I, I think it's okay if they die. Go to Russia and see if it happens. <laughs> Go to China and see if it happens. <laughs> Go to Cuba and see if it happens. <laughs> and God says, my kingdom's no different. And you got a problem with God? Why don't you have a problem with nations? 
God is holy, and so sin and treason against God, it had punishment, and, and God, God clearly told them, he said, you can have everything in this garden, but you can't have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why is it we always want what God doesn't want us to have? So now that I've straightened you out on God is not mean, God is just faithful. And I praise God that he's faithful to his word because that tells me that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he was faithful to me yesterday, he'll be faithful to me in the future. Right. So we're in the series. I'll wait. We're in the series, God Listens to the Blood. We're in a series about the blood. I, I love the blood. I, I love the power of the blood. I grow up singing about the power of the blood, teaching and being taught about the blood, and understanding that without the blood sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, I had no hope in eternity. So last week we talked about Adam and Eve in the fall. And, and can you imagine how bad Adam and Eve felt after the fall? Eve was tricked and deceived, beguiled. And she takes and partakes, and she gives it to Adam, and then he eats. And what's interesting, God says one redeeming thing in Genesis 3.15, that the seed of the woman would rise up and bruise the head of the serpent. He said, yes, the serpent would bruise his heel, but he said the seed of the woman. After the fall, we realize that God expelled them from the garden with flaming swords. And they were the first homeless family in the world, and they were the first dysfunctional family in the world. I don't want a show of hands, but I bet you every family in here has a person that is dysfunctional in your family. If they're not, you married one. <laughs> so I am imagine in this process, in the promise of God, that Eve probably thought, well, you know, the seed of the woman, if I ever have a child, it, it possibly deliver me and Adam from this mess we're in. For God had said, for the seed of the woman... So when she bore two sons, I'm sure she thought maybe she had delivered her deliverer. And maybe one of these boys is going to set it right with the devil. So I really believe that to Adam and Eve, they were just more than sons. They were possible saviors. And this is God's literal promise in the earth that he speaks to Adam and Eve. And so I'm sure they were thinking, well, maybe. God was emphatic. He said it was the seed of the woman. But he did not say it was the seed of Eve. So now let's bring that process into chapter 4. Adam and Eve are in a fix. They're in a bind. God has come down. He's taken an animal. He's sacrificed a lamb. He's clothed them. But they know they have an issue with God. They know they're not allowed back in the garden. They know their relationship has been broken. And maybe one of these sons, according to the promise that God spoke, that from the seed of the woman, maybe one of these sons could help our predicament. If you're looking for a man to help your predicament on earth, I got news for you. You're going to be looking and looking and looking and looking. There was only one man that came that could help this predicament. But let's bring that into chapter 4. Adam and Eve raised their sons, I'm sure, knowing in the Lord that they had to have sacrifices before God. I'm sure that they taught them how to worship the Lord. I'm sure that they felt that one of them could straighten this mass out. That is what they had in mind. Have you ever handed up with something different than what God had in mind? Or than what you had in mind? So they are worshipers, and they offer up to God their best offering. Cain offers his father's mistakes. He offers the fruit of the ground. Abel offers his father's correct action. He offers the father's solution, heaven's solution, a lamb. And the scripture says, in the process of time that Cain brought to the fruit of the ground unto the Lord... And Abel also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and the fat thereof. Oh, praise God, he understood gifts, tithes, and offerings. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and unto his offering he had no respect. And Cain was very wroth, and he's angry and upset, and his countenance fell, and the Lord showed up. And he said, Cain, what's wrong with you? Why is your countenance falling? Why, why are you walking around pouting like a little kid? And here it is. Here it is. Here's the conundrum of every believer. If thou doest well. If thou doest well. Say with me. If thou doest well. Mm, shall thou not be accepted? What is God telling him? He says, you know what to do. 
Your mom and daddy taught you what to do. You know what to do. God is not having to educate him on something he had never heard. He knew about the lambs that were saying. He knew about God covering his mommy and daddy and taking those fig leaves that Adam had sewed together. And the Bible said he had stitched them together. And Satan literally had Adam and Eve in stitches. And God came and he said, those stitches won't work. The works of man won't work. I'm going to have to go get a lamb, slay a lamb. And I'm going to clothe you with the blood running down their legs. Those kids knew what God's plan was and what redemption cost. And God is, God is telling me, he said, you know what to do. You know what I love about the Holy Spirit? He'll tell you, you know what to do. True. Say, I know what to do. I know it is amazing to me that when, when you get, catch your kids with a hand in the cookie jar and they're like, what are you doing? Like, I don't know. What do you mean that you don't know what you're doing? <laughs> it's like the insanity plea. <laughs> How could he be insane if he ran off from the crime? I mean, you know what I mean? And there it is, if you know what to do and you know what you're supposed to do, God was telling you. Believers, you know what to do. God's Word has told you what to do. You have an impartation of the Holy Spirit. You know what to do. And God said, if you do it, it'll go well with you. If you do it, it will go well with you. Amen. Wow. It will be well with you and God is telling something Him, you'll have my respect. God says something amazing about himself, and it's very important. In one sentence, God takes away every excuse that man will ever have. You'll never have an excuse before God. If you do well, will I not receive you? You're never going to stand before God in the judgment and say, I didn't know. I didn't understand. I got news for you. Everyone's going to stand before the Lord in judgment, and we're going to have to give an account of what we did here in this life. Right. Amen. One amen there. <laughs> there should be a big amen there. If you know that, it might change the way you live. And here's where God says something about himself. It's very important. He says, if you do well, you'll have my respect. God says, I'm not prejudiced. I'm not unfair. I don't play favorites. I won't be better to you than I will be to her. I praise that about God. He is not a respecter of persons and he doesn't play favorites. God is a respecter of principles. Say with me. God is a respecter of principles. See, when I grew up, I, I used to think that God had favorites. Did any of you ever grow up in a situation where maybe you went to school or maybe in your family, but they had somebody had favorites and you dealt with a situation where there were favorites? Anybody other than myself? I, there, I had four brothers and one sister. I was in the middle. So between what was at the top and what was at the bottom, I had no chance to be a favorite. <laughs> until I became a preacher. <laughs> mm. I got even with every one of them right there. My mama, I went, from, I went from the black sheep to Pastor Steve. <laughs> but I really used to think God played favorites. But what God does is he acts on our principles. So if I change what I do, change, and I can change what I get. Because just because you're down in Christ does not mean you're out. If you change what you're doing, you can change what you get in Christ. Because God said, I had respect unto Abel in his sacrifice, and God liked it. He received it. Do you know the praise and worship we just gave God? You know God liked it. You know he loved it. You know he received it. Yes. He liked it. He loved it. He received it. And he respects it. I praise God that he respects our offering. The reality is the favor of God. And the word respect there, and I told you this week I would identify what the word respect. The word respect there really is translated favor. Anybody in this room have the favor of God on your life? Yes. Amen. If you're born again, you got the favor of God on your life. If your name is in the Lamb's book of life and you ain't going to hell, you got the favor of God in your life. God, help me. Help me understand what... God had given you opportunities others didn't get, jobs you weren't even qualified for. Doors that God opened that only God could open. Have you ever walked into a blessing that made no sense? Show hands. Anybody ever walk into a blessing that made no Look around the room. That's why you got haters. God loved Abel. He loved the sacrifice he gave. He loved the offering that he brought. And the reality of that, Cain was jealous of that. And God tells Cain, you, you can fix this. You can, God gives him a chance. He says, you can fix this, brother. Say, I can fix it. 
Haters didn't start today. They, they will go all the way back to Genesis. Satan hated mankind. And that hate got into Adam and Eve, and then that hate got into Cain. And Cain hated Abel because God liked him and favored him. He hated him because God favored It's unfair that you would, somebody would hate you because God loved you. Have you ever lived long enough there's some people don't like you just because you're born again Christian? I remember I told the Lord one time, I don't understand what, what, why people don't like me. I said, I, I, people don't like me, haven't even met me. He said, it's the Spirit of God within you, son. Get over it. Okay, I'm going to give you a clue. They hated Jesus. Okay, I'm going to give you a clue. They hated Jesus. Jesus said, if they hate me, they, they might hate you. And God shows up and he confronts Cain and he says, what's wrong with you, brother? Why are you acting like this? And this is the kicker. God says, you can still fix it. You have just as much chance as your brother. You can still fix this. It blows my mind as a pastor who I counsel people and I tell them, you can still fix it. And they won't. You can still fix it and they won't. And that is what heaven says every day in the mercy of God. You can still fix it if you want to. The problem is sometimes we run into the spirit of Saul. And the rebellion that he had against God, which was treason. And now Cain, the man who would not kill a lamb that God had ordered, is ready to kill a man. Cain, who would not kill a lamb to cover his sin, is now ready to kill a man, his own brother. Okay, let me put it this way. Cain, who would not kill a lamb, is now ready to kill his own brother in Christ. Okay, I'll move on. Sometimes our solution is worse than the dilemma. We need to see this moment. Cain does not leave the presence of God. To fit. God has a conversation with Cain. He says, if you do well, you'll be accepted. Say, if I do well, I'll be accepted. I do, well, I'll be accepted. do you two boys know that if you do well, you'll be accepted to your mommy and daddy? That's a secret, boys. That's a secret. Because one of you are going to get the inheritance. <laughs> I'm just messing with these boys. I love them. I've, I've seen them since they were this big. I can't believe how fast they've grown up. One's in the military service country. The next guy is going to be on the pro golf tour. So praise God. God bless you boys. <laughs> and that's the last week. You're the great white fisherman. So now I'm jealous. And God tells Cain specifically, you can fix this. And he leaves the presence of God. And immediately he goes to find his brother Abel. And he says, hey, let's go into the field. Hey, let's, let's, let's go into the... He just left the presence of God. Say with me, he just left the presence of God. We just left the presence of God in praise and worship because the Bible says he inhabits the praises of his worship and the praises of his children in Israel. We just left the presence of God. Now where are you going? Where are you going? And he goes to the presence of the one God favored. And like the snake he is, he says to him, you cannot miss this. Let's go into the field. Say with me, let's go into the field. Ooh. What did he say? He said, come on into my territory. I don't want to fight you in your territory. Come on over to my territory where I'm strong, where I have dominion. I don't want to fight you in heaven, Jesus, because I don't want to fight you in the presence of the Father. I don't want to fight you in heaven. Say location, location, location. The reality is this is a statement to come of the field being the prophetic foreshadowing of where the fight was going to occur. That Abel goes to Cain's territory is a foreshadowing of Christ having to come to the earth. That Abel would go to Cain's territory is a foreshadowing that Christ would have to come to the earth. A shadow is always a result of an object standing in light. So the New Testament is the object. The Old Testament is the shadow. Jesus is the object. 
Abel is the shadow. The reason the shadow is moving in the Old Testament is because Jesus is moving in the New Testament in heaven. And here God is using us the shadow to teach us about the object. Come over into my field. So here comes Jesus, I mean here comes Abel. And he goes into the field, you're going to catch me in a minute. And he comes and he leaves his territory. And he comes into Cain's field. Where Cain dominates and rules. Cain didn't try to kill Abel in the presence of the father. He didn't try to kill Abel in the presence of Adam and Eve. Satan didn't try to kill Jesus in the presence of heaven. Come on over into my field. Come into my territory. This is where Cain says, I, I have dominion, I rule here. And this is always a seduction of the enemy. Always. Come on over into my territory. Come on over here where you're vulnerable. Where you don't have dominion. Where you're out of, out of your element. Come on over here. Because Satan knows if he can't kill you, he wants to corrupt you. So the enemy will tice you. Come on over to this bar. <laughs> Come on over to her house. Ah, oh, got real, real quiet. My God. Come on over to this gossip session we're having. We don't drink, smoke, cuss, or chew. We don't run around with those who do, so I'll make it spiritual. Come on over to this land of unforgiveness. Come on over to anger. Come on over to bitterness. Come on over where I rule and have dominion and authority. And I'll mess you up. That's Satan's agenda. That's his objective. Come on over into my playground. And we talk about the devil's playground and what it is. I got news for you. The church can be the devil's playground. The church can be the devil's playground. Don't kid yourself. So I'm here to kick the devil out. And make this a place for the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to tell you today, if you know to do well and you don't do it, God says to Cain, he said, you're cursed. This is under grace, brothers and sisters. That law hadn't even been given yet. I'm preaching better than you're acting, but that's okay. That's okay. It's always a seduction of the enemy. Come on, come on over here. Let's play in my playground. <laughs> I, ha I have to deal with the Holy Spirit, so I, I, I can't even watch movies that y'all can watch. When, when we watch television, if a movie comes on, I have to ask the Holy Spirit, can I watch this movie? Because what I found out is the devil saying, come on over here. I'm serious. I was one time, they were sitting with a bunch of people, family members, not, not this family member. They were sitting around talking about a movie they are watching, and, and they're like, you, you ain't never seen it? And I was like, no, I've never seen it. They're like, everybody's seen it. I said, I haven't seen it. And they're like, well, what's wrong with you? I said, the Holy Spirit won't let me defile my anointing. Amen. I still can't watch it to this day. Amen. What are you letting the devil tempt you over into? <laughs> Come on over here. Come on over here. I got something I want to explain to you. So when Abel came to the field, or when Christ came to the earth, they killed him. They killed him. They killed him. And it's interesting that Abel was killed by his brother. Scripture says that Jesus, he came unto his own brothers and they received him not this is not about Cain and Abel this is not about Cain and Abel it's about Jesus everything in your Bible is about Jesus Christ everything in your Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 26 is about Jesus Christ and him coming as the Savior of the Lord of mankind and he being Jesus Christ God in the flesh Emmanuel God with us and just like Thomas we need to come to the point he's not just your Savior he is your Lord and your God that's who he is so this story is about Jesus somebody say man 
It's about Jesus. My God Almighty, it's about my Savior. Come on into the field. <laughs> Come on down out of heaven. Unwrap yourself from your glory. Unwrap yourself from your righteousness and your holiness and put on flesh and come into the earth out of the womb of a virgin. And now Satan says, I got him where, right where I want him. I got him in my territory. I got him on the earth and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a party now. But he forgot one thing. He forgot one thing. He forgot one thing. He forgot one thing. Jesus was also the Word of God. The Word of God. The Word of God made flesh. And he didn't know it that in the temptation, the devil went out there and tempted him every way man can be tempted. And Jesus said, you forgot on the Word. You forgot on the Word. On the Word. It is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You forgot, devil. You forgot on the Word of God also. And he whipped Word on him. He whipped Word on him. You want to whip the devil? Whip Word on him. I can use Old Testament word. I can use Old Testament scripture and beat a New Testament devil with the word of God because it's the same yesterday, today, forever. Never lost its power. So Satan thought, well, I got him in human flesh, but he forgot that's the incarnate God wrapped in flesh who was the word that became flesh. And the word with the devil. He forgot about that. <laughs> oh, you're the word too. Ooh. That must smart. So God's looking for Cain. Where are you, buddy? He said, uh, I can't find your brother. Where's your brother? And that's companion to his daddy. Where are you, Adam? So the curse continues from Adam to Cain. Be careful how you live. <laughs> Be careful how you live, parents. Be careful how you live. Where's your brother? Where are you, Adam? Companions. And I love his answer. I don't know. <laughs> he said, I ain't going to say anything on the grounds that might incriminate me. Maybe God will leave me alone about it. You ever wish God would leave you alone about something? <laughs> All right, am I the only one? Am I the only you know, idiot in here? <laughs> and God says, listen. Everybody say, Listen. And God says, hold it, I, I hear a frequency in the earth. You know, there are sounds in this room right now you can't hear, but they're in this room. They're frequencies. They exist. There's radio waves in here right now, and they have sounds, and they have music, and they have words, and they're frequency. You can't hear them, but they exist. Your eardrum can only hear a certain range of audible sound. We hear only at a certain level. Do you know if I brought ten dogs in here and brought a dog whistle, you wouldn't hear the whistle, but every dog in here would. Now, if I'm going to blow my whistle, if you guys say something, I know you're a dog. But the reality is, there are audible sounds in the spirit that God can hear. There are radio, radio waves going all through this room right now. And God says, listen, Cain, listen. There are sounds right now. I hear a sound, and it's a certain level. And he says, I hear the sound... I'm listening of your brother's blood, and it's crying in the earth. I hear the sound of your... Cain says, I can't hear nothing. And God says, I hear the sound of your brother's blood, and it's crying. Listen, to all my atheist friends out there, I got news for you. You may not hear the sound of the gospel, but that does not mean it's not real, and that it does not exist, and that it's not powerful, and it's not anointed with the Word of God, the mind of God, the power of God. Just because you can't hear it don't mean it's not real and doesn't exist. So that's all my atheist friends out there. You can't hear the gospel, I got news for you. Don't make it illegitimate. So God says, I, I hear a sound, Cain. Don't you hear that? I hear the sound of your brother's blood. It's crying out to me. So my question is, what? The voice. And that's what your scripture says. The voice of thy brother's blood crieth to me from the ground. I didn't know blood had a voice. Now you know why God chose blood. That's the required medium for redemption. Now you know why God chose blood. God isn't gory. He's not messy. He, he doesn't like a muddy, uh, just a bloody mess. But blood has voice. Say, blood has a voice. Blood has a voice. 
So if the, if the blood of a man has voiced my God, how much more the Son of God, who lived a perfect life, shed his blood, how much more his mighty, powerful blood, the voice that it would have in heaven. My God Almighty. Think about that. I hear Abel's voice, and I'm hearing that sound. Cain couldn't hear it, but God could. I'm going to tell you right now, there are cries we have in the middle of the night, and you think nobody hears, but heaven hears your cry. So that's why God chose blood, because it speaks. Say, it speaks. Well, that was written in Hebrews. That was 3,000 years later from the time that that happened, 4,000 years, excuse me. And the writer of the Hebrews, which I believe is Apostle Paul, he's saying, 4,000 years ago he was slain. And you know, they never found, they never found uh, Abel's body, they never found it. We know what Cain did, and Cain was a horrible, horrible, horrible man, just like his daddy. He disposed of the body, but he left a witness in the earth, and the witness was the blood of Cain. Excuse me, the blood of Abel. See, God left a witness in the earth, and it's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when it fell off that tree on Calvary, it hit the ground too. And the ground swallowed it up. But that's not all that happened with that precious blood. So in Hebrews 11.4, Paul says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained a witness that he was righteous. Say with me, I praise God. Praise God. The blood of Jesus, Jesus. has made, made me righteous. Woo! Most people get excited about that. The blood of Jesus has made me righteous. What you don't know is what I know about you because what your wife or your spouse or your kids have told me in counseling. You can't believe what I know about you. And I know the blood of Jesus has made you righteous. Right. Right. Hallelujah. Praise your kids call me. Praise I don't ask them to call. They just call. <laughs> I don't know how they get my phone number. Wow. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead, yet he yet being dead, yet speaketh. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, a better covenant, and the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than the blood of Abel. Abel's blood spoke vengeance. Abel's blood spoke vengeance. Abel's blood spoke justice. God said, I'm a God that is just. Do you know your God is a God of justice? Jeremiah writes, because of the loving kindness and devotion of the Lord, we are not consumed. For his mercies never fail. They are new every morning. Say they are new every morning. Amen. Great is your faithfulness, God. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will have hope. I have hope because I know there's mercy in God and his blood. Yes. Hallelujah. So how does God have new mercy every day? God has so much mercy. That he doesn't use yesterday's mercy on your life today. God uses fresh mercy on you every day. He doesn't use leftover mercy. He doesn't use mercy that's been on the shelf and expired. He uses new mercy on you every day. My God Almighty. That's good. He doesn't use your leftover mercy on me. He got new mercy for me and you. So the writer of the Hebrew talks about this arrangement of the tabernacle of the Old Testament. Within the tabernacle was the Ark of the Covenant, which... Included the mercy seat. Guys, we got that picture ready? Okay. Can't be playing Xbox back there, boys. <laughs> I'll take a drink while they uh, do their techno thing. The Ark of the Covenant was a chest containing... Anybody know what was in the Ark of the Covenant? So we had the, the uh, stone tablets, Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod that budded, and jar of manna. That's the three things that were in the ark. So we have, we have the Ten Commandments. Maybe you want to grab my stick, I won't teach here a minute. We have the Ten Commandments. The tablets that God gave Moses over the second tablets. Moses broke the first one. He's the only man that ever broke all ten commandments at once. But he did. <laughs> now once a year, on the day of Passover, 
the high priest of Israel, he would have to take a lamb. After all the other families had brought their lambs. And the priest of Israel would slay the lambs. And they would apply the blood. But the only blood that went to the Holy of Holies was the blood that was brought by the high priest after he had slayed the lamb. And the high priest, after he had slayed the lamb, he had to take the blood of the lamb. And nobody could touch him. Once he had slayed that lamb, nobody could touch him. If you touched him, you were in trouble. And they would tie a rope on his leg so that when he went into the holy place, he would go to the altar of incense. But then he would go into the holy of holies. And they tied a rope on his leg in case he messed up and he died. They could pull him out. That's a fact. Absolute fact. Absolutely. And he had bells all around his garments so they could hear, yeah, he's alive still. He's still alive. You'd hear the clanging, the clanging. Yeah, he's still alive in there. <laughs> and he would go into the Holy of Holies. And he would take the blood of the Passover lamb, a perfect lamb. No spot, no blemish. And they would examine it for 14 days to make sure it was pure. And he would take that blood and he would apply it right here. And that's known as the mercy seat. The mercy seat of God. And God abode was right here. And that's a teraphim and the seraphim, representation of heaven, what's in heaven. And if God accepted the sacrifice, the priest would come out, and the blood of that Passover lamb, it would cover the sins of Israel for one year. One year only. One year only. Now, do you remember after Jesus rose from the dead, and he was in the garden, and Mary was there at the tomb, and she was crying, and he came up to her, and he said, Mary... And she said, Rabboni, and she turns around and she realizes Jesus. And she wants to come over and worship him and bow at his feet. And he says, don't touch me, don't touch me, don't touch me, don't touch me. For I have not yet ascended unto heaven. What was Jesus saying? Remember I told you, you, once the high priest had the blood of the lamb, you couldn't touch him. It was holy, sinless blood that God said, only holy, sinless blood can be applied to the mercy seat. So, in this situation, when Jesus told Mary, you can't touch me. Jesus ascended to heaven and he deposited blood in heaven on the mercy seat. Hallelujah. 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 And the reason it's called the mercy seat is because the blood of Jesus Christ, mercy, 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 mercy. Say it with me. Mercy, 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 mercy. So all God hears all day long is mercy, 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 mercy. So that's why when he wakes up the next day, mercy, 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 mercy. That's what the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ has done for you. So let me tell you something. Here's the blood. Where's the law? Down here in the bottom of the ark. Say the blood's over the law. No, say it. The blood's over the law. The law said I was guilty and I needed condemned and needed death. That's what the law said. You were guilty, you were condemned, and you needed death. How many in here have ever sinned? Then you've committed treason against heaven. And you shall surely die. That's what the law said. So down here we have the law, but here, the blood is above the law. Woo, hallelujah. The blood is above the law right here. Say with me, the blood of my Jesus is above the law. Hallelujah. God Almighty, I praise you for the blood. The law that condemned me said I should die. Jesus said, I got some blood that cries mercy every day. So now you know why you get new mercies every day. Because in heaven, and this exists in heaven at the throne of God. Don't touch me, Mary. I got some blood I got to take up there. I got some blood I got to go deposit on the mercy seat. I got some blood. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. I got some blood. Because I know Stephen, he's going to need that blood. I know you. You're going to need that blood. And Jesus goes and he deposits it right there. And God said, there will never need to be another sacrifice. 
He said, that's the blood I've been looking for for 4,000 years. And now you know that voice has blood. And that's why God chose blood as the redemptive medium. Because blood has a voice. Next week I'm going to finish what else blood has. You have no idea. Blood, blood has other stuff. Blood has other stuff. It doesn't just have a voice. It just doesn't have a voice. I'm so excited I better get out of there before I start preaching it. So, all right, I got to get away from that. So the Ark of the Covenant contained the Ten Commandments, and this is where God clearly teaches us that the blood is above the law. So I, I want to finish with this scripture. Let's see here. So we know that the blood, it covered. And according to the New Testament, Jesus said it is the remission of sin. And it removes sin. So anybody remember the Old Testament story of Noah and the ark? Anybody know that story? Who is the ark? Jesus. Who's the ark? Jesus. So Jesus is the ark, right? Paul said, my life is hid in Christ. Right? My life is hid in Christ. That, that's where my life is. So when God looks at me, He doesn't see me. He sees Jesus in the blood. Because that's who I'm hid in. That's a fact. When Jesus is looking at you, He's like, oh my goodness, where are you, Stephen? I'm in Christ. I'm in the ark with Jesus Christ. That's my ark. And on top of my ark is blood. So Paul tells us in Romans that Jesus Christ had become the propitiation of our sin. Anybody know what a propitiator is? So it's on the space shuttle when it comes back into the earth. That, 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 those heat shields, that's called a propitiator. And what the propitiator does is it takes all the wrath of coming and all the friction of coming back into the earth's atmosphere and it shields the people inside the space shuttle. Guys, you got that picture? So as this space shuttle's coming back in, so as you're living your life, and you're going through all of the trauma of life, and the ups and the downs, and you're going through, because Paul tells us, he said, don't you know you're in a war? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God to pull you down strong. Do you know you're in a war with the enemy? He wants your territory, he wants your dominion, and after that he wants your kids. Look at Adam and Eve. He got them, he got Cain. So as you go through life and you go through difficult situations, anybody in this room ever gone through a difficult situation? Anybody in here live? God said, you're in the ark, you're in the space shuttle. And God said, everything that comes against us in life and the wrath of God, the wrath of the enemy, God said, Jesus will be your propitiation. He said, Jesus is my shield. He is my shield and my buckler, David said. And all of life, the things that want to burn you up, and the enemy wants to destroy you and take your life and burn you up and destroy you, Jesus said, I'll stand in the way. I'll stand in the gap for it. I'll take the heat, is what Jesus said. I'll take the heat. My God Almighty. I'm going to get this tape myself. That's what Jesus said. I'll take the heat. And the blood made this possible. So you're in the ark today. The blood of Jesus is above the law. The law that tried to kill me, that told me. Paul said the power of the law is sin. He said that. That's what he said. He said the law is designed to show you you ain't worthy. And you'll never be able to do it yourself. And he says, actually, Jesus, you know, Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. But he came to fulfill the law. And that's why the law is still in there. There's aspects of the law that, that Jesus said, I'm going to fulfill all that. And so this is what God has done. The wrath of God was put on Christ. Jesus Christ, he was sanctified himself so that we could live. He was sacrificed, excuse me, sacrificed himself. So Jesus is your propitiator. Anybody ever live long enough to see Jesus take some of your, some of the heat? <laughs> some of your heat? <laughs> yeah, anybody live long enough to realize, my God, you got me through that one, Lord? Really, you got me through that? He's your propitiator. And that's what Paul tells us. He didn't just redeem you by your blood. He says, I'm going to protect you by the blood. 
You remember what God told Moses? Sprinkle the blood on the children of Israel. Sprinkle the blood. Say there's protection in the blood. No, 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 no. There's protection in the blood, brothers and sisters. My God. I remember years ago when a brother taught me the power of the blood when they were praying for people that were dealing with demonic issues and stuff. One thing demons can't stand is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They cannot stand it. For it has destroyed their kingdom. But by his blood he entered once into the holy place. Everybody say once. Having obtained eternal redemption for us. So now we know. The story of Cain and Abel is about Jesus coming to earth. Can I give you a little secret? Can I tell you a little secret? Don't tell anybody this. Don't tell anybody this. Cain could not hear Abel's blood speak. Satan can't hear the blood of Jesus speak. That's why he's so confused why Jesus keeps forgiving you over and over and over and over and over again. And he's like, I thought I had him on this one. I thought I had her on that one. I thought I had him there because he can't hear. Mercy, 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 mercy. Give God a shout. Hallelujah. So every time, every time you mess up, Satan thinks he's got you. He can't hear it. He can't hear it. I thought, I thought I had Stephen with that one. He can't hear the blood. Cain couldn't hear Abel's blood. Whoa! Praise God! How many praise God for the blood? My Jesus, my Jesus, my Jesus, my Jesus. I know none of you have ever had any sin issues, so God bless you. I had a few, and I needed blood. I needed powerful blood. And I needed blood that said, mercy, mercy, mercy. I know you all goody two-shoes, but I needed blood that said, mercy, 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 my God, unto that man. And the devil's like, what happened? What happened? Stand up for the blessing. He thought he had you, but he couldn't hear. Mercy. If you need that mercy of God, don't you leave here today. Come up here and I'll introduce you to the man. Jesus Christ, my Lord and my God. Father, we just pray your blessing on this word today. We thank you for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you that you, you started in Genesis telling us the story. You started in Genesis. And you finished it in the New Testament. Oh my God, we thank you for that blood. It doesn't just cover, it removes. It removes. <laughs> I have been declared innocent and my record has been expunged. Thank you, God, for the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Get your hand up for the blessing. God told Aaron, you bless my people on this wise. And God said, you shall do this. God wasn't joking. He said, this is how powerful my blood is. Israel, when you were in the wilderness there, and you were down around them golden idols, and you were doing all that evil stuff, under the blood of bulls and goats, I covered that sin. And he said, this is my heart. Even back then, under the blood of a lamb. Now we're under the blood of the lamb, Jesus Christ. Receive this. God says this to you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And God said, if you'll put my name on your children, I will seek them. And you need to understand that whole prayer has been made available by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you agree, say amen. amen. Guys, boys, put on our God is holy. You're dismissed. Hello, one and all. We have been receiving questions regarding where to send tithes and offerings. If you'd like to mail it in, you can do so at P.O. Box 2223, Sholo, Arizona. 85902. And please, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, share, and subscribe. While you're at it, like us on Facebook. Link is in the description. And follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Link is also in the description. Helps out us, helps out the channel, and most importantly, shows that this is a format you wish to see continue. And with that, we wish you a blessed week.